Uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Anna Kshmabusa. I'm the director of the Europe Center here at Stanford University. Um, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Don Thiel today to the first spring quarter session of our seminar series. Uh, Professor Thiel teaches at the University of Pennsylvania and is the author of the award-winning Forging the Franchise, The Political Origins of the Women's Vote, and the editor of Field Experiments and Their Critics. She's highly regarded as a specialist on both historical and contemporary political party competition and coalition building, and especially on women's participation in electoral politics as voters, as candidates, and as constituencies. So today we're delighted to welcome Professor Thiel as she presents her most recent research entitled Geography and the Gender Gap, Evidence Against the Traditional Vote Hypothesis from post suffrage Sweden. Um, as always, we will have the opportunity to ask questions after the presentation, so please use the Q&A function on your screen. Um, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Thiel. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Let me pull my slides up here. And thanks for coming, even though you all are just coming off of spring break. I'm impressed by everyone's stamina in the Zoom world. I know I myself am getting fatigued of this and cannot wait to be back in person. And hopefully someday we'll get to visit you all face to face. Um, so my, I think of myself as a political economist of gender, and I have a fair amount of research that looks at contemporary issues of representation uh, in the United States. But I think I would say that my enduring interests, my first love and lasting love, uh, has to do with understanding the long term historical, political, and now kind of geographic transformations that have made women more or less able to participate fully in public life. So I'm going to talk to you today about the paper that I circulated, but also frame that with respect to a larger book project that I'm just beginning work on. And I'm happy to hear anything you have to say, uh, any ideas you have for me. And I don't think I can answer questions while we're going, but I look forward to the Q&A. OK, so my first book, which uh, Anna summarized a little bit, is Forging the Franchise. Um, here I look at the political logic underpinning women's enfranchisement, basically arguing that in order for women to get voting rights in a particular moment, in a particular sort of electoral or election cycle, there has to be high levels of political competition, which make politicians open to the entrepreneurial challenge of recruiting new voters and changing electoral law, uh, at the same time that there has to be robust mobilization by women for suffrage, because this communicates to political parties both uh, the potential voting constituency, like the numerical power of women's potential votes, as well as information about the preferences that women are likely to have. And so I argue that competition and mobilization help explain the timing of suffrage across and within cases. So why it takes so long for women to get voting rights in some countries, uh, whereas in others, it's, it's quicker. Um, as part of this project, I thought a lot about what politicians and women's activists believed and said about how women were going to participate as political actors thereafter. And ideas about women as voters percolated you know, from the very first suggestion that women might potentially have voting rights. And um, I would say people said everything across the board that they were gonna be in the pockets of the priests, you know, subject to the low murmurs of the confessional, um, that they were going to be uh, you know, in yellow dresses, which is a suffrage color, but red cloaks, which is of course the communist color, um, or that they were going to vote exactly the way that their husbands did because they were gonna to be told how to vote by their husbands. And the, you know, the predictions were all across the board, um, but mostly parties, uh, parties fores foresaw doom as a result of enfranchising women. Um, but the question remains that, you know, we, we really don't have a great answer for is did suffrage matter? So how did women vote? Uh, which parties did they align with in, you know, different countries around the world? Um, and did, did women participating in politics change policy outcomes thereafter? Uh, this is, these have been questions that have been, um, whose answers have been attempted since the early 20th century. The very first paper on ecological inference actually had a woman co-author, Inez Goltra, um, and it was trying to answer the question of how women voted in the Western states in the US. Um, most behavioral work that is subject to many problems of ecological inference suggests that women's participation was relatively lackluster. And the, the kind of cutting edge research coming out of the United States suggests that 
for the most part, women voted for the locally dominant party. So kind of like men, they were just less likely to vote for nascent third parties, which actually is something that that remains the case today. So women are less likely to vote for the far left or you know, the far right you know, nationalist populist parties, although they are more likely to be in green parties, which is maybe, maybe, maybe contrary to that, to that general trend. Um, so I think we can summarize the camps, both, the, both like the things that were said in the early 20th century, but also the sort of scholarly predictions as falling into three categories uh, that women merely doubled the vote um, they voted the way that their husbands did, that they were traditional voters, which is definitely the conventional wisdom is that women were more conservative than men in the early 20th century, or what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is that, well, the impact of women's suffrage on electoral outcomes and the gender gap in the past actually depends on electoral geography and political institutions. So the types of institutions that determine, you know, electoral rules in the country and the places where men and women turn out, uh, as well as who they support in those in those particular districts. So think like urban versus rural districts is going to be is going to be key to my argument here. Um, and what I would say is, although. I always found the traditional vote hypothesis kind of compelling, especially in light of Englehart and Norris's work about the transition from the traditional to modern and what we know about the 50s and 60s and women's conservatism in that period. Um, there are a lot of things about the early 20th century that are actually much more similar to the late part of the 20th century than they are to the post-World War II period. Uh, and that has to do with the gendered political economy. So, there were there was high levels of mobilization by women in women's organizations. Um, there were you know higher levels of women's labor force participation than in than after World War II. Uh, birth rates were falling. Age of marriage was rising, and there were lots of single women in cities all over all over the kind of OECD world um, that were you know working as domestics, but also in factories for the first time. And so there were a lot of things that were that are different about that period of time that might make us think that the types of women who were likelier to turn out in the early 20th century may actually have been less conservative than those women that were mobilized thereafter as we have a conservative, conservative shift in the world at large, as well as kind of you know, the re-domestication of women and the housewifeization of women that happens after World War II. Um, moreover, and this is something that's like in the back of my mind for this book project and a couple of other little papers I've been working on, um, PR systems, uh, especially those with large urban, urban populations, so PR systems tend to produce higher levels of turnout overall, and when there's, uh, you know, urban density, women get caught, swept up in that same mechanism that turns men out, and so there's something about, you um, the propensity to vote in the cities and the high level of turnout that actually can contribute to national gender gaps that don't go don't go for the traditional vote hypothesis. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so as I said, there was you know dynamism in the early 20th century, high labor force participation, large social movements, etc. And just to give you a sense of you know some of the intuition behind why women the women that participated may have been more progressive than we have thought. Uh, it wouldn't be a suffrage talk without some of the iconography from the era. So you can see here just the cover of various leftist magazines, you know, give mother the vote, we need it for health, play, home, schools, work, et cetera. Um, you know, like uh, magazines talking about how uh, working women need to vote and that women, um, women's wages are going to be improved as a result of women's enfranchisement. And so the point here is that the like a lot of the types of propaganda and the cultural sort of artifacts from this time period are pointing to a potential progressive force among the women who are likely to be politically active in this time period. And I should say, finally, that there's a pretty large political economy literature, not just in the United States, but also in, in Europe, that shows that after women were enfranchised, various aspects of public spending um, increased dramatically. So both the size of the welfare state, as well as specific budgetary line items related to education, related to health, related to sanitation, um, you know, uh, maternal mortality fell and the years of education increased. 
you know, there were there are lots of these um, policy outcomes that economists have studied that have shown a progressive impact of women's enfranchisement. And so what I'm what I want to figure out, like the bigger picture that I'm interested in is how can we square the seemingly lackluster participation of women that's come out of the United States research, research and the potential conservatism that is like the kind of dominant idea about how women voted with this political economy literature that's showing us that there were like expansions of the welfare state post suffrage. And so that's the bigger project that I'm involved with, um, that I'm involved with right now, just to give you a, a brief sense of this, I'm calling it the gender gap in the welfare state. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for a political link between women's post suffrage mobilization and the well documented fiscal policy expansions that, the, that I was just talking about. Um, so I think of this project as having two phases one that is better developed than the next. Uh, phase one is studying the post-suffrage gender gap. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about Sweden. And then phase two, someday post COVID, when my children are back in school full-time, um, <laughs> I'm like a housekeeper again. So we're gonna to try to study, I'm gonna to try to study the link between the gender gap, the electoral system, and then the gender-based policies that emerge thereafter. So I'm happy to talk about any of those things. But for this phase and the paper that I circulated today, I'm thinking about estimating and understanding the post-suffrage gender gap. So this is a fundamentally hard problem because uh, first of all, polling didn't really exist. I mean, Gallup gets started in the late 1930s, but that's like really an American project. And there is a European tradition of survey research, but it's not very robust. Um, in this period. So there's not, there's not a lot of polling data. And most countries did not record how women voted, right? You've got the secret ballot in most places when women get voting rights. And for the most part, men and women go to like the same line to cast their ballots and they put their ballots in the same urn. Um, there's an asterisk there because there are uh, Chile and Argentina are exceptions. And there are a couple random elections where men's and women's votes were tallied separately. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I've been working on Chile and Argentina with some collaborators and, you know, more on that in the future. Um, but in the majority of countries in the world, we don't know how women actually voted. So the question becomes, how can we estimate the partisan gender voting gap post suffrage? Um, and this is an ecological inference problem. And, you know, the challenge here is that the big challenge from the EI literature perspective is that although there is variation in the proportion of women that live in different types of, of locales, so like there tend to be more women in the cities always, but in this period as well, and fewer women in mining districts, um, although there is some variation, there, it, there's actually not that much variation across the country. So it'll be between 46% and 52% or something. So most of the EI packages that exist out there and Gary King's packages perform much better at estimating difference in participation or in partisan preferences when there are really big geographical, when there's geographical segregation of groups. So, you know, um, majority minority districts in the United States, et cetera. So that's the biggest reason why the EI inference techniques aren't necessarily as good for thinking about how women voted post suffrage. Um, the other issue, and this is something I know from like reading electoral histories of 111 countries or 151 countries, I've got it written here, is that uh, the conditions under which women were enfranchised are really different across different countries. Um, so a lot of places, you know, the extension will be federal, federalized, so different provinces get it at different times. A lot of times women get the vote right after a major, um, a major electoral reform, so you've got kind of a cocktail of treatments problems. A lot of times the electoral reform bill will have been a really big bill that will have included not just women, but also a large number of men, like in the UK in 1918. Um, and a lot of times they do a massive redistricting at the same time. So these are all things that even in the best circumstances with, with you know, lots of geographic variation in women in the population, um, you still wouldn't be able to estimate the post suffrage gender gap because there was some other kind of juggernaut that hit at the same time. So what I did is I looked at these electoral histories and I tried to narrow down countries based on not having any of those major changes occur at the same time. And I was looking for places that had fine grained data. And so that's one of the reasons why I first became interested in the gender vote gap in Sweden. 
Um, and so, you know, I'm going to talk to you just a very little bit about about Sweden, and then we'll get into the estimates because I want to make sure that we have we have time for all of the empirics that are coming up. So, why Sweden? Um, well, first of all, Sweden's a really interesting place to think about because it is one of the leaders in gender equality today by many different accounts, but you know, it wasn't always the case. So if you think about like Alva Myrdal, Gunnar Myrdal's wife and the kind of activism that she was involved with in the 20s and 30s, um, there was sort of like late industrialization in Sweden and not a ton of emphasis on education, especially education of women. And so it's both an interesting place to think about today, as well as a country where the kind of, although the women's movement was robust, it wasn't necessarily the most industrialized or modernized of the European countries in the moment in, when, in which women were enfranchised. Um, so here I have just a graph of women's turnout that begins in these this handful of European countries uh, in which we know women's turnout, um, measured by the kind of number of women that voted over the proportion of women that were eligible to vote in the population. These are just a handful of European countries and the United States is there. And what you can see here is that Sweden is not an outlier in terms of uh, political participation of women in Europe in this time period. There are more women that participate in Sweden than in the USA and then in Iceland early on. Um, you know, Sweden, like all of these other countries, except for the United States and Iceland in the earlier period, used proportional electoral rules, which is kind of part of my larger story, but doesn't really play into this paper here. So in any case, it's a place where women's participation was more robust than in the US, which is kind of my key comparative case in the back of my mind, because that's what we know the most about, um, but it was not by any means an outlier. So because I'm going to just sort of go through this and then talk to you about the, um, the empirical part a little bit more, let me give you a crash course on Sweden. I promise you I know more about Sweden than this, but this is, I think, all we need to know uh, in order to get into the details of the, pop of the, of the paper. So it was and is sparsely populated. It's sort of like the left side of the apostrophe, or sorry, it's the right side of the apostrophe. You know, the left side is, is shared with Norway. Um, it was in charge of Norway for a long period of time in, in you know, the 19th century. Uh, the nation state consolidated really early. Uh, it was a great economic power in the 16th century, um, but kind of petered out and then, you know, became uh, more industrial advanced, but not until the 1950s, really. Um, the elections were competitive at the national level since the 1880s. There was a pretty strong agrarian movement, but there it wasn't like the landed elite were, were that strong, although there had been in like a pretty powerful enclosure movement in the 19th century that kicked a lot of um, a lot of small smallhold farmers off of their land. Uh, the manhood franchise was extended in 1907 and 1909, and the first election with manhood franchise was in 1911. Uh, in that same year, the country adopted PR under the Dante rules, which tend to favor larger parties. They used, you could, you could um, group as electoral cartels uh, in, the, in the various districts. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more that, about that in a minute, but for the most part, the social Democrats were not a big force until the twenties and then the thirties, but they would often coalesce with the liberals for, you know, for running elections. And then the agrarian party and the conservative parties would group together as well. Um, womanhood franchise was extended in one fell swoop in 1919, and it had to pass a second, second ch uh, chamber um, in 1921, and the first election where women could vote was 1921. So there was a large suffrage movement. 12% um, of the female population signed a petition um, to get women voting rights. And overall, in the legislative debates, the Social Democrats and the liberals were the most supportive of suffrage reform. And this is sort of different because in a lot of different countries, in a lot of other countries, the liberals are against enfranchisement, but the far, like the farther left and the conservatives are the ones who ultimately push it through. So, but that's, that's different in this case. So what did people say in Sweden in this time period about women's votes? Well, there's this early behavioralist, Herbert Tingston, who uh, doesn't know what a weighted average is, but he wrote a very important book in 1937, and he argued that there was a strong correlation between social position and conservatism. Um, it fa follows as a matter of course that women's suffrage becomes an asset to parties on the conservative wing. So here we have the traditional vote hypothesis in one of its kind of first pronouncements in the 30s. Um, by, by uh, you know, a newspaper man and a, and a political scientist. 
Um, early public opinion researchers uh, from Sweden concluded that it may have been true that Swedish women tended to prefer right-wing parties. They were looking at the, the, the 40s. Um, the same polls show that the non-socialist parties had larger proportion of female supporters than did the socialist parties. Um, but some sort of different things come out of the, um, the, the newspapers in this time period. So an op-ed from 1921 quoted a liberal parliamentarian, liberal parliamentarian who stated that the right wing should be the first to work for the women's vote since the right is likely to gain a lot of votes. They are on average more conservative than the men. So again, the traditional vote hypothesis. But in 1925, a conservative opinion writer was concerned that women working in industry tended to vote more than women who were farmers and homemakers. And the author feared that this is going to help, help the social Democrats. And this is exactly the point that I make in this paper, which is to say uh, the gender gap depends not only on the preference of the, um, of the woman in the average district, but the average woman's preference aggregated up. So if the women in the cities are more likely to vote left and the cities vote, vote left, and there's more women who are voting in the cities than in the countryside, then the gender gap at the national level can tilt left. Um, I already talked to you about the problems of ecological inference, but basically, again, you know, we don't know how women voted, so we have to estimate it. There's not enough variation across locales to get a precise estimate of this. Um, but, you know, my intuition is that we actually have a fair amount of information about men's preferences from prior elections, especially in the case where the electoral system didn't change wholesale with the introduction of women's suffrage. And so what I'm gonna try to do is use kind of prior expectations or prior understandings of how women, of how men voted at the local level uh, as input into my prediction of how men voted. And that's gonna help me back out or recover algebraically with like very simple algebra, how women must have voted under these different assumptions about men's political behavior. Um, and the advantage of studying Sweden, besides some of these you know, reform characteristics is that they have amazing data at the municipality level, uh, more than 26 ob observations, which is like, you know, more than quarter, three times what Porter and Wolbrecht have for the entire United States for a much smaller kind of population. Um, 2,600 observations, it's complete. And the average district size is really low. So there's about 1,200 people um, per district. The final thing that's awesome about Sweden in this period um, and Norway is similar is that although they did not make men and women cast their ballots in separate urns, they did record turnout separately for men and women. So a big challenge for ecological inference is that we often don't know um, the proportion of a group that voted. And so for most of the countries like the United States, we don't know how many women actually voted. So we have to make an assumption about how many women voted. And then we use all of those assumptions. We make some more assumptions and then we predict you know, the party, the party uh, outcome, the party vote, ch vote choice. But in Sweden, we know the proportion of women that voted, the number of women that cast ballots in a given electoral district, that's a very small district. So that sidesteps having to do one set of estimates. So uh, it's less kind of problematic and messy in that way. Um, so my approach is pretty simple, triangulation. I'm gonna use information on men's past vote choice as proxies for their future, future loyalties. And then I'm going to kind of play with those with those parameters a little bit, or those assumptions a little bit. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of things. I'll explain this, but use something called Goodman's accounting identity to estimate the gender gap at the local level. I'm going to also compare these estimates to what David Friedman, who is sort of a famous statistician at Berkeley, who always liked things to be very parsimonious, um, called the neighborhood model. And then I'm going to talk also about like the most common method that, that's used right now to think about post-suffrage outcomes, and that's the diff and diff method. Um, so what I do is, for the ease of comparison, I aggregate the left and the right. Um, the communists, which were really very small proportion of the electorate in this period with the social democrats and the liberals, that's the red line at the top. And you can see that they are winning in this period overall, not necessarily forming the government. This is just the you know uh, party vote share. And then the conservatives and the agrarians are on the bottom here. And here I have uh, each one of the years on the bottom is just the election year, and then the gray line is the first year after women win the vote. Um, 
again, I do this collapsing because in a lot of the districts, the smaller parties uh, will run as cartels with the larger parties. And so in this period, the liberals are the larger part, lar largest of the red parties, um, but the social democrats begin to ascend into power uh, after this period. So this picture here is gonna show you how I'm gonna present all of the re results that I'm about to show you. And so I'm gonna walk you through this really quickly. So because the prior, the sort of, uh, null hypothesis, as it were, is that women were more conservative, they were going to be more supportive of the right. I'm going to look at my predictions of how women voted uh, using information about men's past behavior uh, as a the, the, the predicted vote share of each group for the right. So that's what's going to be on the y-axis. And then I'm going to show you this data um, with the distribution on the bottom here being the log of valid, valid votes cast. And so the point here is that the large cities, um, Stockholm, Göteborg, and Malmö, uh, each with sort of more than 90,000 eligible voters, I think Stockholm had 250,000 people in this, in this time period, those guys are gonna be out on the right-hand side. And as you can see, there's just like a ton of these 2,600 municipalities that are, that are much smaller than that. So all of my estimates are gonna be presented like in this form. Okay, so the first thing to note, and this is not a finding, this is just a fact, is that support for the right is low in the larger districts. So these are lowest smooth lines across the distribution here. So it's just taking, you know, um, smoothing an average across the distribution of districts on the on the x-axis. And the, the, the blue line here is how men voted in 1920. And the orange line is how all voters voted in 1921. Okay, and so what you can see is that the vote share for the right was higher in 1920 in places that were in municipalities that were smaller, and then it kind of goes down and then it maybe creeps back up a little bit um, in the large districts, but there's not a lot of observations there. And then in 1921, there's actually a pretty different shape here where the smaller districts were, were more conservative, something like 65% of all votes were cast for the conservative parties in 1921. And then the larger districts were even more liberal in 1921 than they were in 1920. Um, and so this could be, you know, just sort of a, a, a basic intuition is that uh, the cities became more liberal in 1921. Something was happening. Something was in the air that was making these places more liberal. And 1921, of course, is the, is the first election in which women are voting. Okay, so, oh, how much time do I have and how, many, how much math do I wanna show you? I don't have any more time, so I'm not gonna tell you all this math. What I'm gonna tell you is basically, you can understand that in a district where you're trying to estimate how women voted, you can make an assumption. If you, if, if you say the district average support for the right is 70%, and what you can do is you can say, pretend that all men in that vote district voted for the right what would women's vote share have to be if all men voted for the right? And then you can do the same thing. You can say, pretend that no men in that district voted for the right. What would women's vote share have to be if no men voted for the right? Okay. And within those two simple assumptions, you can put bounds on our estimate for what women's vote share for the right had to have been, because this is just algebra, right? So here you can see these are the bounds. So we know that in the cities, it is not possible for more than 50% of women to have voted for the right. And that's just based on this assumption. And that's not an assumption. It's just based on this algebra here. So with the cities, women obviously were more liberal than, you know, 50%. Um, and in the countryside, you know, it could have been anywhere between 20 and higher than that and 100%. All right, so those are the those are the bounds that have to exist, but those are still pretty wide. I'm going to use how men voted in the past and substitute that in to this algebraic expression in order to think about how men how women might have voted in the in the 1921 election. And a key sort of assumption that I'm using that's underlying the the kind of validity of my approach is that men will behave similarly in 21 as how they had in the past. That might be a shit assumption. I'm totally willing to be reamed out about this, but I will tell you that in the past, men's votes were highly correlated. So this is 1917 and 1920, pretty tight clustering, although of course it's not perfect, it's 0.91. 
I'm going to basically just go ahead and use this assumption that men voted similarly. I'm going to look at, you know, how women mu must have voted if men voted exactly how they had in 1917, if men voted how they had in 1920. And then I'm going to look at the districts where there was the least amount of change, the ones that were closest to this line here um, in, uh, as a final kind of pass at this data. So I'm going to jump right to my results here because we are out of time. Um, okay, so here is a summary of my results. And what we're looking at is my prediction for the share of women who voted for the right in this sort of center column, the share of men who voted for the right, and then the national right gap. So if it's negative, that suggests that women are more favorable for the left than men. And then there are these you know, five or six different ways of looking at this. One is just assuming that men and women voted in the exact same way. And I have, I predict a extremely small um, women's preference for the left. I look at municipalities where men's votes didn't change really at all between 1920 and 1917. And there I estimate that women are 4.3 percentage points more favorable of the right. And then I have other estimates that are higher than that, 11 points, 15 points, and nine points um, in some instances when I'm using regression, basically all pointing to a negative right gap. So the shocking thing about these findings is that the most kind of conservative model is the neighborhood model that predicts that women are still more favorable for the left than men. And then all of these other models, including when I use a lot of controls, um, predicts that women are more favorable of the left than men at the national level. So overall, the biggest takeaway is that I don't find evidence for the traditional vote hypothesis here. And that's, I think, because of electoral geography. So I'm going to take two minutes to show you this. So the first thing to note is that women's share of turnout was very high in the cities. So they were more than 50% of all voters in the cities from the very first election when they voted. So they are numerically adding more to the total vote share, the total number of votes in the population in the cities from the very first election than men are. Um, and the second thing is that my predictions are really being driven by the participate the the sort of situation of women in the urban areas. So here in this figure, I'm separating out the urban areas are in orange and the rural municipalities are in green. And I have women in the electorate, so like the share of women among eligible voters on the x-axis here. And then on the y-axis, I'm looking at turnout as a percent of all voters. So the left side is showing you that women turn out at higher rates when they are a larger proportion of the electorate. So it's like they are a bigger electoral force in places that where they were a bigger potential electoral force. So I think that's good uh, for the for all the, the sort of assumptions that underlie EI. And then on the right hand side, I'm just showing you my prediction of the right vote gap. And there's a zero line there that's demarcated by red. And here you can see that there are a bunch of green sort of more rurally municipalities where I predict that women are less supportive of the right than men. Um, but, you know, these places where women are uh, a larger share of the electorate, more of those observations are below this line. So the point is there are more women in the cities. Women turn out at lower rates in the cities, but they are a greater share of the electorate in the cities. This is like just algebra. And in those places, I'm predicting that women are more supportive of the left. Okay. I don't think that men are turning out at higher rates to counteract women, but I'm interested in thinking about a lot of other threats to inference that you guys might have uh, in the back of your mind. And I'm gonna uh, summarize here and conclude. Okay, so this larger book project is trying to understand if there's a link between the post suffer gender gap and the welfare state. Here in this sort of small paper about Sweden, I'm really trying to think about um, the relationship between electoral geography and the national level preference gap. And when compared to the United States, uh, it looks to me like, just as in the US, women tended to vote for the locally dominant parties. They were more conservative than men on average in the countryside, and they were more liberal than men on average in the cities. Uh, and so that, that can contribute to kind of a growing urban rural cleavage Right, it's sort of like stabilizing within the municipality, but on the in the country as a whole, it's it's more polarizing. Um, 
if you were to draw a municipality at random from Sweden, there's 2,600 of these, you would estimate that women were more conservative than men. But because of the clustering of people across populations, the sort of the, the distribution of women in the cities and the leftism of the cities, the national gender gap, I estimate is to the left. So besides this sort of narrow point that we need to think more about how we're constructing averages when we're thinking about the gender gap um, using historical data, I also wanted to make just like a couple of broader points about why it's interesting to think about the gender gap in the past, besides the fact that like I'm fascinated with this, you know, what else, why might you be, why might you care? And I think to me, the biggest issue is this normative framing of women prior to 1980 as being kind of hopelessly reactionary and pious and traditional and clinging to marriage and, and the church and tradition because they were screwed if they didn't, right? Because they had no protection from labor force, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, that is a feature of the post-World War II economy where uh, women were fired for getting married, you lost, you know, you could lose jobs or not be hireable if you were pregnant. Uh, but the political economy that essentially prized itself on the single male breadwinner model in a lot of different countries. It didn't have to be that way. The 20s were a very different beast. And so I think thinking about this earlier period can help us not just correct some fictions that exist, but also help us think about women's agency and emancipation in the early 20th century, raising the puzzle of like, well, what happens in the 50s and 60s? Like, why does that happen? Which I think is important just to understand, but also to think about how, where we're sitting in 2020, is that the year it is? <laughs> where we're sitting in 2020, how it could change again, right? Like we've had massive social movements, but there's also been um, a huge she session as a result of the coronavirus and a return to the home for many women, men too, but the consequences for women's labor have been way more severe as opposed to after 08, right? Where it was a he session. Um, and what the longer term impact of that is going to be on the politics of the household and party politics is something, thinking about this long durée, I think can help put some of that, that into perspective. So an inflection point in the gender gap uh, challenges the kind of simple modernization view of the last century and kind of a historicized theory, thinking about electoral geography might help us understand more about our present time period as well. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up um, and I'm happy to entertain all questions, comments, critiques, concerns. Wonderful, thank you so much, Don. Um, please, if anybody has any questions, please use the Q&A box and um, ask your questions. So, um, and already some are show, is showing up. I was going to take, so you know, the, abuse my privilege as chair and ask a first question, which is in accounting for this national uh, gap, um, you know, at various points you mentioned sort of differential mobilization, you mentioned the local dominance of parties, but there also might be different political issues at stake for men and for women. Um, so I'm sort of wondering, how do we adjudicate among these different drivers of this, uh, the gap? So basically it's like, why are women more highly mobilized in cities than they are in rural areas? This is a great question. I mean, I have a couple of ideas and I think it really depends on, on the country, but, um, one thing in Sweden is that the largest suffrage organizations were engaged in registration and mobilization drives post-suffrage, and they tended to be in the cities. So as I kind of talked about in, in my job market paper uh, many years ago, like the mobilizational infrastructure provided by the suffrage movement, like that was something that was an incentive for political parties to support enfranchising women when they had that infrastructure and the ground game in place. So what's interesting in Sweden is that and unlike Norway, is that the Social Democrats wanted the Women's Party organization to remain autonomous from the larger party organization. So women weren't given power in the SAP um, in the SAP organization. They paid dues, though, 
So they raised money independently and they paid dues to the party and they, and they made reports, but they still weren't allowed to be a part of the overall structure. So I think that the fact that they remained autonomous, as we've seen with many women's organizations and the power of women's organizations um, in other contexts, allowed them to have their own sort of uh, mobilizing apparatus that was totally separate from the parties in, in until the 40s, so in the 20s and 30s. So I think that the I think that the SAP Women's Organization was a key part of urban mobilization, and they were interested in domestic laborers, but also like, you know, there weren't that many unions that catered to women in this time period. Like there were dairy, you know, there was like some cigar unions that women were were in, and they were like a big part of that workforce. But the but the dairy workforce too, but also service. And I think that that's where the key mobilization happened. We see in a lot of other countries that rural women turned out at lower rates than men, and at lower at lower rates than in the than in the urban areas. And you know, there are lots of ideas about that. One is like opportunity cost of voting. So if the homestead is far away from the place where you can where you go to vote, the transportation costs may be more difficult to overcome for women that live farther away from polling stations. You know, part of it may be uh, there's slightly more education or more information available to women who are in the urban areas than those who are in the rural areas. It could be a, 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 a greater conservatism of women who are in uh, of, of households of men who were in the countryside. Sometimes men would forbid women from voting. That could be more common. And then it's also, I think, related to um, the, the household configurations where if you look at the population distribution in Sweden in this time period, um, the women who, there are more women in the cities and the women who are there are younger on average. They, are, they tend to delay marriage longer. So the men who are there are older and they are married, but there's lots of women, mostly in domestic service, who are, who are younger, who are there. And so I think all of these things are potential mechanisms. Now, figuring out what, which one's the most important, my intuition is it's about the, uh, it's about the women's organizations. You know, Oyvind Skorg and I have been talking about like how to collect this. He's got some of this data for Norway. And so we're moving in that direction, but we don't yet have that for Sweden. So we have several questions that I think in many ways already, you know, very much referred to what you were just talking about. Um, so first one, Michal Gluczynski, um, first, would you not achieve similar results in case of a growing rural urban divide, right? That's what's driving really this is a bigger gap between rural and urban voting rather than between men and women. Um, and secondly, there's a question about the current gender gap and the gender gap you find in the cities in Sweden being driven by fewer women being married. Right. So the kind of service economy that you were just mentioning. Yes, absolutely. So I think that's a I think that's a really big part of it. And I don't, I mean, I hesitate to add another layer of ecological inference to my ecological inference, thinking about at the municipality level, the proportion of women that are employed or like that would be considered laborers. But I do have the census data and I've thought about adding some more of that detailed information to um to a chapter I'm working on. The problem is that I won't have intercensal observations between elections. So I would be interpolating data uh, about women's labor force participation at the, at the municipality level. And the kind of places where this is more interesting are places where the municipalities are much larger, so it's harder to do. I will say that I've been collecting this data um, from some Swedish geographers that talk about the process of industrialization. So like whether you went, like what kind of, uh, what direction you went in industrialization. Cause like sometimes places that were semi-industrial became de-industrialized even in the twenties because they weren't connected to a major artery port, et cetera. And so I do have some of that, but all I can do is essentially calculate averages across these different types of, types of industrial uh, configurations for the parishes. Um, okay, Gary is asking me, so what's the SAP interested in? So the interesting thing about the Swedish Social Democrats and like this guy, kind of this professorial guy, Jalmar Bronting, who's, who's kind of like the brains behind the operation in this period, is that they're, they are a very moderate, uh, a very moderate Social Democratic Party, especially you know, yeah, they're very moderate. So they care a lot about national level, like nationally led industrialization rather than nationalization of the resources and things like hydroelectric 
hydroelectric power is like one of the really big things that they're interested in in this time period. So like pushing an agenda of industrialization is the key. Uh, they do some crazy things with like labor laws where they do forced arbitration. So like that's a big issue that's on the agenda. There's some stuff related to prohibition at this period, at this time period too. Um, so like that's part of the national conversation. Um, and then uh, there, there are things about education and freedom of the press. And these are all kind of key, um, key, key things that are being fought out in 1917 and 1921. Um, but I would say the big thing is Jean-Marc Branting's like national uh, investment in the economy, nationally led infrastructural development and hydroelectric power. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, goodness. Urbanizations led to demands for programmatic policies because of the need for government to address things like sanitation, infrastructure, et cetera. Is that part of the argument? Yeah, so... For sure. Uh, this is Didi's question. Thank you very much, Didi. So um, sanitation is a big thing that women are concerned with. Wage. So there's like, there's wage equality and the women's organizations begin to push for uh, health care and maternity leave um, and like, like guaranteed maternity. Leave. So like in Sweden in 1922, I think it is, there is a uh, the first country that gives a nationally guaranteed resting period prior to giving birth for women who work in factories and then a period afterwards. And there's a push even in the 20s for women to have the right to breastfeed their infants. Um, so those are things that the that the uh, women's organizations were concerned with. Um, there's also uh, sa like sanitation in the cities, but also the quality of the milk is another kind of major concern of the women's organizations um, and the educational issue. So a lot of times, even when schools existed in the countryside, women weren't allowed to go to the schools. And um, that was another thing that they were pushing for in this period. So it's, I, I know the Lazarian Persical argument that kind of Didi is pointing to there. And I think that that's definitely part of the story. Uh, Fran, Fran just, um Let's see, she also applied to men, right? Men having more left preferences in urban centers. John, if you wouldn't mind repeating the question because we, we're the only ones who can see the questions. Uh, oh, so I'm so sorry, you guys. All right, all right, that's, that's annoying. Right. <laughs> I'm like mumbling to myself reading. I don't have my glasses on, so I actually can't see. Um, <laughs> I can, uh, so so uh, Francesca's question is about the urban rural cleavage and how that should apply to men as well, right? So what's distinctive about women in urban cities, aren't they just part of this urban rural cleavage? that would drive male and female voters. That's great. Yeah, so basically, I think that's a fine assumption to make. I would say that there are just more of them and they're younger than the men on average in the cities. And whereas the men in the cities, the men in the cities are more likely to be married than the women in the cities. So the women in the cities are quite different than the men in the cities. It's like, it's very similar in New York City, right? Like the place you don't wanna move if you are a heterosexual woman who wants to get married is New York City when you're young, right? Because it's impossible to basically find a match there. Where you want to go is Denver, because that's called Menver and there's all the dudes. I'm serious. So in any case, um, the women are different. And I agree that like, basically they have the same kind of preference. There's just more of them. And so it's okay that they have the same, it's okay that they have like a similar preference to the men in those same places. The point is that from before this, we thought that women were more conservative than men. So when you aggregate it up based on the distribution of them across the countryside, I actually don't think that that's the case in Sweden. Um, okay, and I see Christoph, hi Christoph, nice to see you. I see your question. Is there evidence that in countries with compulsory voting, parties on the right rather than the left benefited from the introduction of women's suffrage? Thank you very much for asking that question. In fact, um, so I think it's going to depend again on, you know, the conservatism of the rural areas vis-a-vis -vis the cities. It depends on how, uh, which parties are benefited by the electoral rules. And it depends on, you know, these electoral rules that you're, that you're suggesting. So in Chile, where they introduce compulsory voting shortly after women are enfranchised, you do see this sort of uh, big increase in the Christian Democratic Party's overall success and in their share of the votes that's driven by women. 
But the point to make here is that the reason the Christian Democrats are successful in capturing women's votes in Chile is not just because women in Chile are hopelessly conservative. It is because the space where women are most effectively able to mobilize in Chile in leadership positions and to you know, carry out their beneficence work is within the structure of the church. So it's not the case that like they're just hopelessly dogmatic. It's about the networks that women are able to form in different countries. And so in Chile, it was through the Catholic Church that women's organizations could become more powerful and that you know women all over the country could essentially rise more easily to positions of power. And that has to do with the fact that like the Liberal Party was a boys club. They wanted nothing to do with the suffragists. Um, and the fact that uh, the kind of the Christian Democrats were sort of more centrist in, in Chile in this time period than many of the Christian Democratic parties were in Europe, in Europe slightly earlier. So uh, that's a very long answer to your question. But yes, in the country that I know that, it, that had compulsory voting shortly after suffrage, the Christian Democrats seemed to win out. But I don't think it's just because of this sort of like, you know, this sort of like genetic conservatism of women. Is there other questions? Um, I was going to ask you know, to project into the future, right? So what happens in the 40s and 50s as the whole sort of you know, welfare state model really takes off um, in Sweden? Yeah, so basically what I'm interested in is the, this comparison between Sweden and Norway. And essentially like we think of them if you read the gender political economy literature, like my advisor, Francis Rosenbluth from, you know, like the eighties and onward, you think of like Sweden and Norway as being the same, right? These are places that are the same. It's like great to be a woman there, blah, blah, blah. Public sector jobs, yada, yada, yada. In fact, the forties and fifties are very different in both countries where like in the Swedish system, there is much more emphasis on the right to work among women and the multi breadwinner model among women. Whereas in the Norwegian model, the male breadwinner, the Norwegian system in the 30s, 40s, 50s, the male breadwinner is enshrined into law for much longer. So into the 70s and 80s. And those things have to be ratcheted back. So it's like some of the, the earlier policies, women in the civil service, maternity leave, um, oh, there's, there's others, there's wage, arbitration agreements, although women tend to do different jobs, but within unions, those things are way better for women in the Swedish system when the welfare party gets started than they are in the Norwegian system. So like, I'm actually really interested in trying to think about those differences. And just as like, you know, a totally unsubstantiated claim. I mean, my intuition is that this is because of the way, it's because women were more likely to be supportive of the social Democrats than they were in Sweden where the liberal party was, it was in power longer in that period, but also because the social democratic women maintain this autonomous apparatus for longer. Whereas in Norway, it gets sucked into the party apparatus the same way that it does in the United States. So basically like the women's branch gets like pulled in and then like pushed, like put it in a drawer. And that's like what happens in the Republican party in the United States um, in the twenties and thirties. So I think it's about, it's about like which parties are in power where their bases of bases of power are, the support of women for those parties, and then the sort of power that women's organizations have to shape the legislative agenda. And I will say, like, Alva Myrdal was pretty crucial. I mean, she's not the only person, but she's kind of like one of these compelling figures. Um, she was pretty crucial for establishing a lot of the ideas about. Uh, women's right to work in Sweden in this time period. And like the public intellectual sort of stance that like, you know, role that she played, I think was crucial in crafting those narratives um, in the forties and fifties. Ironically, because Gunnar was like a total crazy person, <laughs> you know, and he was not an equal parent or equal partner or anything like that. So it wasn't her own household. It was sort of like this like vision for her own household that she was writing about and then telling everybody they had to set things up this way. And then like they did. <laughs> so did the national parties recognize what was going on? Did they see this gender gap? Did they respond to it in any way? 
Yeah, so I'm trying to get more information on that. I've got um, I'm, I've got some conversations to to talk with some RAs about about reading some of the like internal party dialogues. The Social Democrats knew that women were a large part of their their voters in the cities, and so I have some evidence like that the manifestos of the Social Democrats began to began to like take some of these like. Uh, women worker policies onto their platforms, whereas like the liberal, the liberal party in Norway maintains the like traditional family model within its platform. Um, so you see the, that, that like divergence uh, from the very first election in Sweden. Um, but yeah, there's propaganda, you know, there's, they are, they, and they are aware also that the, uh, that the Frederica Brenner Society and the SAP Women's Organization is like actually contributing a fair amount of money in terms of dues to the national organization. So, so yeah, the question is like, are they aware of it at a locally targeted level? I think a lot about, I think Gary, I don't know if you're still here or paying attention, but like I've thought a lot about how, you know, do you target your core voters in swing states or, or swing voters in core states? And I'm not sure if there was that level of sophistication in targeting voters in the 20s, but it's something that I'm definitely curious about because in a way, what you would want to do is, is focus on the sort of semi-urban areas or like the areas that are just like outside of the major cities where you already know that turnout is really high and focus essentially on like mobilizing women in those particular places. Um, the problem is, you know, I don't speak Swedish, which is like so stupid. I wish I did. Like, why don't, you know, why, why? But um, so I'm not gonna be able to do that work by myself, but there's actually some pretty good, like there's a lot that's written. I've had a couple of RAs help me come through things already, but it's, it's a larger project to take on, so. Fantastic. Well, wonderful analysis of both the sources of women's leverage and the consequences of women's leverage in politics and electoral politics. Um, this has been absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much. And everyone, please join me in uh, thanking Dawn and Craig. Fantastic project. So thank you. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it.